thank you so much for uh, joining me today. Um, I wanted to ask, though, uh, just because we were talking about pronunciation, what is the nickname Kafis? I was kind of curious what that was like. Um, actually, this was the name of my first ever D&D character that I was playing. So I got it very, very early on, and it slowly started to be my nickname between my friends. And it's something that I started to use like my art, like my artistic alias, and it just stayed with me. So I have a really huge sentiment for D&D and, you know, my first ever character played with it. So yeah, that's that's the origin story of this nickname. So you've been into the 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 like that the gaming world uh, like early that you started early uh, as far as a, yes. like a player. Yes, like I would say that I was playing games like my whole life, like since I was super little. Um, I didn't have Amiga and it did, did this type of consoles when I was young, but I was playing a lot of games on DOS system that was brought from my cousin. So. Yeah, I was playing a lot, a lot, a lot, and uh, it was mostly computer games. And when I when I was a teenager, I started also playing role playing games, so paper RPGs as well. And your background is interesting because of like you're more you come from at least from an educational standpoint, you come from an architect uh, architectural yes. background. Now, were where do you discover the architecture and the art side of yourself? How do they, when do they co like coalesce to you realize I can do game design with this? I can do concept design. Like where, at what point in your life did you, did that click for you? Okay. So like, it was quite complicated because like in terms of the art, I was always interested in art and it's, that was something that my parents encouraged a lot and why okay. they were, they were super supportive. And initially I was thinking that maybe I'll be going to some fine art education in the future. Um, but with the schooling and going to the high school, it turns out that I absolutely love math. So it, for me, really? the connection, yeah. So wow. the connect, the connection between, you know, the very, um, strict way of thinking and art. For me, it turned out that architecture might be something that balanced those both sides, right? Absolutely. Um, and at this point, to give you a better understanding, in Poland, there wasn't any type of uh, education and knowledge about the that the games could be, you know, your career path. We had, like, studios, right? But there was no higher type of education in universities, colleges that was, you know, having some kind of faculties that were teaching this one. Um, but it turned out that when I started to study architecture, I met some guys from the, let's say, IT faculty that they were doing games after hours. And it turns wow. out that, okay, maybe that I can just draw things for games, where for me, um, that wasn't, you know, something super clear to know because there was no information online um so basically i can say that after the first semester at the university i started to you know first doing some small indie projects but i already started to also working professionally which at the time was quite easy i would say it was like you have a tablet you can draw you can do the you can do the work <laughs> but it really? was like yeah, it was like 13, 14 years ago, right? So in Poland, there wasn't that much people that were doing digital art. So right. okay. it was it was super easy to like find, you know, the first job just because you know how the tools work. Um, so I would say it was like 10 times easier than nowadays. Um, yeah. And yep. you escalated very quickly. I mean, at least, yeah. I mean, in, in terms of, I mean, honestly, very quickly, you rose up to somebody who was, you know, started out at, you know, just doing what you had said, but then you're doing the designs for these, these uh, games. Um, yep. How quick, I mean, did you, did you realize that that was going to happen or did that just sort of accidentally kind of, did you like find yourself mm. on a, like, like, I don't know, an, an upward slide? Um. I would say that wasn't that quick because like for the 
first few years of my career in games, I was still at the university because I finished the architecture. And I remember at some point, I think it was at the third year of the university where I was studying architecture. After hours, I was doing different commissions for the game companies. I was like in the in a different space in my head when I was mm -hmm. like, I'm putting so much time and effort to architecture, which is, by the way, really hard faculty. It requires like tremendous amount of work. You have a lot of projects. You have those sleepless nights with it. It's very, very hard. Right. Yeah, And I was putting so much time and effort to something that I wasn't like 100% sure that I want to pursue in the future. And to be even more crazy, I also started to work as an architect assistant in the, in the office, you know, in the office. So I was doing all those things in the same time. <laughs> I was sleeping just like three, four hours. But I was going to it... say, like, did you sleep much? <laughs> yeah, not, th not that much, but, you know, I was in my early 20s, so it was... It was possible. It was easier than it would be today. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess. I mean, <laughs> but you're young. I mean, you're, you're like you're young. You're young. That's why I say like. I mean, so so accomplished, and 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 I know like I know that for like say an artist's point of view, like it was very. It did not seem like a short amount of time to you because you were in the thick of it. But I mean, you're you're like you're so accomplished and still so young. It's a uh, it's. Um, it's cool. I would say like. I'm not saying I'm not super young. I'm 33 right now. That's oh, I'm a baby. Yeah, You're I'm, a baby. I'm 42. <laughs> Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> but like I would say, um, there was some point when I was still working in my second job as an architect, and the project that I was working on was coming to an end. That the project that I was specifically hired for. And I made a decision at this moment, and it was before my last year at the university that I'm just leaving architecture. I don't want to do this. Uh, I love games. I can spend countless hours after work just learning about it and, you know, going for internet, drawing stuff. And I thought if something is just driving me crazy and it's something that I really am passionate about, why not try it like to pursue it like full time not just like commissions and smaller bigger works but just pursue it full time so and that must have been scary to 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 make that leap i'd imagine yeah i wouldn't recommend to make such a decision like a year before you finishing university when you know i was thinking about okay i want to finish university and be fully independent so find a job, be able to pay my bills, to take care about myself. Um, so I was working super hard, but then I was super focused on the games, concept art, illustration, this kind of things. So it was 10 times easier to, you know, do one thing at the time, no, 10 other. <laughs> but um, yeah, I spent about two years after that uh, work in freelance and then I started to work in one of the studios like I would say it's middle style size studio like 150 people mm -hmm. um, and I remember that the thing that I always have in the back of my head was I wanted to work on the AAA games because it was something that I felt is a place for me I was also interested in this type of a games myself so now AAA, uh, is, yeah. is that what is what is that I'm, I don't, I'm not familiar with that term okay i like triple a's are basically the biggest titles that you can think of like the witcher games the cyberpunk dying gotcha. light games assassin's creed so the biggest that are on the market with the biggest budgets so right. okay. that was something that i have in the back of my mind because when you're working in a smaller studio you basically, as an artist, do a lot of different stuff. Not only concept art. You are doing like UIs, maybe some marketing art, um, different types of, let's say, 2D art. And I was most mostly interested in concept art, so designing the visuals for the game, not necessarily to be, again, all over the place and do everything again. Yeah, right. 
Yeah, so I remember that at some point there was a E3 conference, which is type of a conference that always shows like the new titles that will be coming in the upcoming years. So there are always the grand reveals of what will be happening in the industry. And I remember seeing the first reveal trailer for Dying Light 2. That's what I was, was going to talk and about. And yeah, that was, Light. yeah, and that was like, oh my God. So, it was absolutely amazing. Now, I, I'm not familiar with the game, but I was looking at your your work on it. It it seems like a really like dark, fun, apocalyptic kind of thing. So just break down basically what what the game is for for like a, a dullard like me because I'm I'm not entirely sure because I I basically stopped playing like video games at like Nintendo sixty four because 3D <laughs> was too much for me. I was like eh. okay. So um, what's the what's the premise of the game? So basically, this is a story happening in one of the Western European cities in Europe. Uh, so after the, it's the second part of the game. So there was a virus that was spread around the world and you're oh. basically a character that's looking for his sister and he's coming to the last standing city in the whole world. Um, so that's the, that's the premise. Mm -hmm. um, okay. It's also a game about the contrast because it comes from the title Dying Light. And Dying Light, it's a moment between the day and the night, the, the transitioning moment. So there will be like a lot of contrast as well coming to, to the story, uh, to the environment, because something that we know that is like, let's say, street level in the environments nowadays is now taken by the infected. So oh. the people to be able to survive, they moved to the rooftops, which is oh. like a new world, like a new ground level for them. Oh, oh God, that sucks for them. Oh, that's but that. That's and, you're, <laughs> but the the uh, the artwork that I mean, the designs that you've done for for that, it's amazing because you you create you. these these actual like functioning identifiable like marketplaces and uh like different themed how like uh different themed like human needs uh being met yes. on these rooftops as a someone as a, with an architectural background like how do you i mean how it's how do you go about that like when you design say a, like something like that do mm -hmm. you make it as realistic as it can be to be something that would work in the real world? Do, or do you take elements of just fantasy and say, oh, well, okay, most normal people are not going to recognize whether or not a structure could do that. I mean, how? what is your approach? Um, I think it's about the find, finding the right balance, but also that's something that should be coming from the creative direction and the art direction from the project. Okay. So saying what's the balance between something that is hip hyper realistic from nowadays and what something could be like a fantasy like can be stylized a little bit because um we need to be also aware that when you're making a game we are also limited technically so we cannot like translate the real world one-to-one -to, -one to the game environment right right so um What's most important to make sure that if a player plays uh, play the game and is in the specific location, he will have like a sense of what the structure is about and understand the logic. He or she doesn't don't need to know like exactly everything, and it doesn't mean that everything should be super functional. You know, all the pipes connecting everywhere in the right space but it should be giving a specific feel and understanding. So working with the references, how this type of a structure of object or object could be looking in the real world is one thing, uh, but I didn't have to be super crazy about every detail of it because I was technically also limited how many objects I could be placing uh, uh, in this okay. type of locations. So, um, and you need to remember that even though structures look, you know, good, there's still yeah, they, some kind of fantasy, right? Yeah, that's it, it's for a layperson. I mean, if somebody told me like 
identify the one that works I, I wouldn't be i wouldn't be able to but yes it definitely has a fantastical element to it um yes. and then even more so i guess we're in a transition so um how did magic come about as far as what what brought you into that into that fold uh i always love hearing that the stories of people getting into the game uh so i i would imagine your work on dying light 2 had to have been a a part of the reason that that was that was happening um actually uh at the at that point when i was approached by wizards because i you was got approached, approached yes Snap. good for you yeah thank you um i was approached by ovidio cartagena which oh, he's, is yeah. he's awesome isn't he's he absolutely yes <laughs> he's absolutely lovely to work with um he's the art director that i working the most for magic He's just the coolest, like, guy. And just, it's so cool, so smart. Uh, I can't, couldn't possibly say better things about him. A video, if you're listening, uh, I'm such a fan. Uh, but so you got to work with Ovidio. So what was your very first assignment for Magic? It was for the Among Head Remastered. So, so my first card wasn't physical. It was for the Alchemy. Uh huh. Uh, and it was printed, I don't know, like a year ago. Is I it think Dusk, there Dusk and Dawn? Is that the one? Yes, yes. This was the Dusk and Dawn. So it's gorgeous. Um, thank I mean, you. It, it <laughs> I was brings, super stressed back then. <laughs> it brings hope to like Amonkhet. Like it, you, I mean, which I thought was impossible. I thought this place is fucked. I mean, it just. Poor Amon Ket, and then to see that, like the way that you know you made it look, it it really it works. I, it was I was like, wow, this one. I, okay. I hope they print this version. So yeah, and, it was printed out like a year and, ago, something like that. So it, it's it's already in the print. Yeah, it's already in the pr printed version. Uh, but I was quite stressed back then because you know first commission mm -hmm. to illustrations, and uh, I had a little bit shorter deadline for it. So, yeah, I was stressed, <laughs> but a video was super lovely and helpful with, you know, directing me with it. And he had a lot of trust uh, for my work. So, yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> and you ended up doing quite a few, um, like, I don't know, do you do you play um, an arena often? Like, not uh, recently. Arena? Not for the past few years. Uh, well, I I prefer to uh play physically uh with commander with my friends before the pandemic hit um but since then i didn't have a chance to like you know uh play it again uh but well, i'm um, always telling myself to try it out again well, the reason i say this is because most uh, like many pieces of your artwork have made it to the big main screen when you're waiting oh. for a game to start like for okay. instance dungeon descent was used for, for, as the main screen for quite a while currently uh solitary sanctuary is being okay. used uh path of peril was used sanctify was used um yeah you, you're you're like you're artwork is is usually the, the the one that you see when you're waiting for somebody to join a game and i was like that you should so you should definitely sign on just to like I, i'm it. missing out <laughs> yeah, i mean it's yeah it's like and by the way the the um the solitary uh the, the solitary sanctuary is just like oh it's like it does everything that you like a fairy tale should do it just calms me down i'm like ah oh. like it's it has the it has all of that like good feeling that disney gives you but without like ripping off disney it's it's completely in its own realm uh what what was the uh the um the uh art or what was the uh like the um basically the, i can't believe i'm blanking on the way that, what they do when they give you that they give you the assignment brief. they call it the yes. brief thank you Arr. <laughs> What was the art brief for that? I'm curious. Was it just like magical castle? I mean, what? Where did that come from? Because it's so gorgeous. Thank you so much. Um, the like the brief was super simple because the concept art, so the design for the castle was already there. Okay. It was, so I got like the concept art to work with. The illustration was about to showing the the view on the castle with the very fairy tale thing. That was basically it. Um, that's, yeah, that's simple enough. Yeah, it was it was simple, but 
also like it was quite challenging for me as an um, you know architect and this logical thinker because it's a huge structure made of the ice and thinking yeah. about how the reflections could be working in such a big structure Ooh, that's that tough. was yeah that was tough and but um i helped myself a lot with the 3d model because i've made a 3d model of the whole castle um created um, material in the program that was the ice um, and it gave me like the initial idea how the lightning could be working by just you know placing the right lights in the in the in the three D program and checking it what's wow. working what's not. Um, so yeah, that was the the that, that, for me it was like the main help to understand how it could be looking from the distance. It was like super tough to make it you know look like the eyes not something that is i don't know made from the air or it's that was quite challenging that yeah that's 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 stuff that like again as a layperson you don't think about but that's that oh that that would be difficult because i mean i can i can't really i, I can draw a circle it's about <laughs> But um, now, one thing that that we share uh, in, we share in common is that we we like e vampires. Vampires. Oh yeah. Are... <laughs> now, uh, what was the what was the vampire movie that you saw that that did it for you? Like your your first real love of vampires, like the the movie that did it. I'm guessing I know what it is, but I would be mm -hmm. curious. I would say that was Dracula by Coppola. Yeah, that was something that I remember was uh, screened in the Polish television each time on the New Year's Eve for many, really? many years. Yes. On New Year's Eve. That's interesting. It's an interesting yeah, movie. But, yeah, but it wasn't like in the public television, let's say, but in the private ones. But they oh, were okay. always screening it. I remember like in the corner uh, of the screen, there was like the red sign that was telling that it's for the adult. Right. <laughs> And you're like, oh, but but I was a kid. Come on, <laughs> by how, one, I, were, I mean, how old were you when you saw it? I think I was maybe like seven. Oh, Oof. Or, that's yeah, that's early to see it. Yeah. I think I thought I was twelve when I saw okay. it. Thirteen, seven. Did did it mess you up pretty <laughs> when you saw it the first time? No, like I was a little bit of scared in some of the scenes, but I was watching it with my parents, so. Yeah, so it wasn't that bad, um, but I was I was very amazed, you know, by the whole aesthetic and cinema cinematography that was there. It was it still stays for today. It's still outstanding, right? Well, what's great about it is that everything that that Coppola did, it was shot analog. Like, there's nothing mm -hmm. in the film that was done with digital. Like, yes. everything was shot like as as is. So it's we're actually able to see like the movement like for instance like that great scene with lucy in the the um crypt when she's oh singing, yes it's they like when they had her do the thing when she gets in the coffin it's just a reverse shot of her getting out of the coffin but then mm -hmm. because they play it backwards it looks all you know kind of eerie but the costumes yes. though right oh my okay. god yeah exactly i think the good design that can stand the the, the, the time and it still looks good it's like objectively for me it's a good design i mean it was i can't i'm not good at pronouncing her name uh the the the, uh, the i i'm going to i'm going to butcher this so i'm sorry if i just, but i aiko aish i aiko aishko no damn Aiko, I, I'm pretty sure. Let's how... say uh, Aiko. Let's say it's Aiko. Let's say Aiko. Uh, Aiko. Yes. Uh, she won the Oscar for that. And um, I okay. What is your favorite outfit in the movie? Just curious. Just curious. Uh, I think it will be the red armor from Dracula. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very, very iconic, and it's based on very simple idea to follow the shapes of a muscle on the body. And that's something that with the with this red that is you know it's just I can I, I'm pretty sure I would be able to just draw it when you will wake up me in the middle of the night because oh, it's wow. so it's something that that really you know still sitting in the back of my head I don't need to you know see it every day I just remember how it looks like 
and the helmet with you know these ears that are referring to the bat it's something yeah, yeah. oh my god i i love lucy's dress because of the way it was designed oh, yeah. it was designed to look like a lizard like attacking like you know the that the, when it blows out it's the, like i'm just that's that's so crafty so so since we're talking vampires um mm -hmm. i'm gonna move on to one of the i think one of the like more like brutal pieces of um uh the innistrad set that uh the crimson vow set or i mm -hmm. believe it was crimson vow i might i might have just had a complete brain fart no it wasn't midnight hunt it was it was crimson vow path of peril now mm -hmm. that we, we we're gonna have to unpack that one because i've got so many questions about it and i'm gonna oh. probably be annoying but um when you get a brief for that like how how do they say like okay you how do, you, do they say like tastefully impale people oh or, yeah <laughs> what what is it because uh, it's 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 not overtly i mean it is you know overtly violent but it's not you know in your face score so break down what that assignment sounded like to you like what what you got from that one <laughs> Uh, I don't have like the exact brief right now in the front of me, but, but it, it was about like the path that's going to the castle and is basically um, filled with bodies that are impaled. Like it was literally like that, but knowing that it's magic and we have so, you know, age limitations to it. Mm -hmm. uh, right from the start, I was looking to, you know, Right, find the right balance between showing and not showing the things mm -hmm. and the way how you can do it and how I approach it is to make sure that all the silhouettes are in the shadow so I can see the overall silhouette but I don't see the details like what is happening in here um, and also I wasn't like putting these elements on you know the very front of the card which will be would be requiring me to put some of the details and show more gory stuff which is not the thing that i wanted to have so i was mostly like looking for interesting silhouettes that will be showing people impaled in different ways but without any detail but more of suggestion what is happening in there it's very it, and just got definitely got the it bringing the vibes of Vlad the Impaler uh, to it. Um, and okay, so I have you here. Since you, I have you here. I have a couple of questions because I, I'm curious. So the blood petals, um, like I never could figure out like where, like what they're they're everywhere and they're beautiful looking. But what what was the like do you know why blood petals were like what was the impetus behind it or sort of was it just a design choice or how did that work because it, it does add that element of blood without it being you know gory i guess what what was the like idea behind that I, i'm curious mm -hmm. if, and if you can't answer i understand if it's like trade secret or whatnot i'm no problem um it was like basically part of the art direction uh, because mm -hmm. of the wedding happening, um, it was like the motif that was repetitively shown in different concept art, and also like pointed out that like this 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 is the aesthetic element a detail that you can be using. Uh, I think it was also in the brief to use them in some way, like okay. a suggestion of them. Um, so I decided to you know use it as something that will be also a framing the whole piece it's, and, I mean, it's, and, it's and directing to the castle right and the castle too um i can can i ask was there a little inspiration of castlevania in there i don't know if you ever played um i played but no it was again it was something uh, th this specific castle was also in the concept art so oh, okay, okay. i was provided with it so um it's it's the question that should be going to the concept artist behind the design. I gotcha. uh, may, um, so like from, from my side, there wasn't an inspiration. Obviously, if you're having, you know, if you like movies and games that require, require vampires, you will be also using different aesthetic choices that were there because it's something that stays in the back of your head, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I gotcha. Okay, I gotcha. And then so with the um the lighting around it too like how how do you light like how i mean 
how do you make a moon pop around like a bunch of it looks like green float i mean there's such cool lighting like how do you do you set that up in the computer too i mean how do you like light a fake castle from underneath and then by the giant moon and then things around it i mean um actually this piece was mostly painted by my hand uh i wasn't using that much 3d um i use it a little bit to the front element so the bodies uh the the ve ve vehicle that is in the front uh but the rest of it was just painted by 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 hand so wow. um i guess it's it comes with the fact that i do this for a very very long time like painting drawing and you know knowing the basics how to set the lightning, how to choose the colors. It's something that with time you do subconsciously. It's not that um, I have like a specific um, idea. It's something that I just started to paint and okay, this looks good. I know that silhouettes should be readable from the distance because the card will be super small. Uh, I knew that always having a lightning behind the, behind the object will help it pop out. Um, so I was basically using the basics from art that I learned with, with the years. So, um, yeah, I, you like, I think you it, learned, it does make sense. <laughs> you learned it, uh, really on your own. It sounds like more, yes. I mean, it's, it was, it was the learn as you go kind of situation. Yeah. Uh, have you, have, and then I've also read that you have a passion for speaking about the work that you do to audiences and you do it quite yes. often at conventions. Um, and I believe you've even taught concept art uh, to class, at least I've through your LinkedIn. Am I correct in that? Yes. So, again, like how, how do you find the time to do everything? I mean, like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. Your work ethic is, is something to be ad ad admired, but uh, how, how do you, uh, cause you know, a lot of people, when they get into a successful position such as yours, they're like, the last thing they want to do is teach. Cause they're like, I, I don't, you know, I don't want to for whatever reason, but you have a passion for it. You have a passion for sharing the information. Like, tell me about that. Um, first of all, um, I'm also a very extroverted person. So I like to go into events. I like to meet people. I like to talk to them. Um, I always have this urge to, just share what I know. And it was always with me, I would say. Um, at some point, yes, I was teaching in a small art atelier uh, in Poland and I was teaching concept art classes, but I decided for after a year uh, and a half that this is too much because I was doing, you know, full-time job at the studio. I was doing Magic the Gathering already. And teaching, even though I love it like so much, <laughs> I love it so much. It was, you know, taking a lot of my time because I believe if I'm doing something, I want to give 100% from me to it, make it the best way I can. So it, it makes sense for me to put my heart and soul into, into it. Um, and because I decided, okay, I don't have time i need time to rest uh then i decided to just stop teaching uh at the at, at atelier so the events turned out to be for me like the only occasion when i can do this right so i also do workshops besides you know lectures and i can have specific time of a focus of just preparing this one lecture about this one specific subject um, and it's not taking as much time as, for example, having two months of workshops about one thing, right? Right, right. So for me, it was like going to the events is like a compromise for that, to, to share it. And I also think a reason for that is I remember the times where there wasn't that much information online. So I was teaching, I was teaching, I was learning from other artists that I was meeting at different conventions and I want to give, give back to people right now uh, yeah, to, to just help them out. I, I also believe that there is a still a huge need for good specialists 
specialists and the only way to like you know even spark the idea for someone is to you know show them this could be done that way this is the knowledge that you should be having to be able to do that one right yes so it's it seems like it's inordinately even more difficult as time goes by the further time goes by it it becomes more and more difficult to break into the industry period right i mean mm -hmm. would you say how much has how much more difficult has it become since you started mm -hmm. like i mean is it it's how how difficult is it now compared to when you started to get into the industry i mean even in maybe uh, it, maybe it's still some there's somewhat of a market in poland but i don't know i mean it seems like poland's gotten like pretty competitive as well yeah we have a lot of companies in poland i would say like in comparison to other countries around us and overall in europe we have a pretty lo a lot of studios i would say bigger yeah. smaller um so um in terms of how it's harder it it's hard for me to say for sure it's 10 times easier to have to find the knowledge and to learn the stuff and maybe because of that there is more people interested in pursuing concept art and illustration and let's say digital art at all overall um but there's a lot more studios as well at the same time so um, i would say the the level of the skill that is now needed to start working industry it is much higher than it was like i don't know 10 years ago for mm -hmm. sure um but it's hard to me to to like say exactly how it, harder it is because in the one way there's 10 times more positions to be filled mm -hmm. and there is like 10 times more information online because i remember and it's quite funny that for now you can go to the youtube and just find the tutorials and learn a lot. And I remember the times when there was like, in the whole YouTube, there was maybe two or three speed painting videos available, like literally, wow. like, believe me, it was like, it was, that was it. <laughs> That's nuts. Yeah. That's nuts. Yeah. So whole... because the, there's so many now. I mean, the, there's like, it's proliferated to like, there's thousands of them. Yes, exactly. Now, AI, mm -hmm. we the dreaded, you know, the, the dreaded AI. We, gotta, we yes. have to talk about it. But um, so, how do you combat against it personally? Uh, what are you? What are your steps to do to to prevent it from happening to you as much as you can prevent it mm -hmm. from happening? What are you currently doing that maybe other artists could? learn about to do for themselves to, to stop it from being thieved mm -hmm. like um, first of all what's important to mention that ai how it looks like now and how it works right now it cre it generates images that are trying to be more and more let's say technically correct so visually pleasing and interesting etc and if i would need to define myself as an artist. I'm I'm a concept artist first and foremost, and the concept art is ten times more things than just creating images, because we are solving the problems for for the gameplay and for the ton of technical issues. And for now, AI is not helping with it. It's it it, it just cannot do the work of the concept artist right now. If mm -hmm. you're creating illustration, yeah, it's scary if that's something that you're fo full, fully focusing on. So just, let's say, just creating images. Mm -hmm. um, but from the concept art point of view, it it's not just, just doesn't do the job, okay? Mm -hmm. um, okay? You need to know a lot about the pipelines and how the game is made. You need to work with the game editor. It's not something that could be replaced nowadays by AI. So I'm not, you know, feeling the dread of losing my job at all. Right, um, right. But as an it, illustrator, what do you, yeah. are there any precautions that you can take to protect, say, your pieces that you've done for magic? Or like, what are some things that you can mm -hmm. do to make sure that it, it's, if it's stolen, it's not going to be able to be used as like 
like is there any sort of technology out there that you guys are using like artists are, are talking about that maybe help prevent that from happening um you know like there is a software that is currently developed by one of the universities i'm not sure which one maybe chicago one uh that is called a glaze so it's a program okay. where, where you're putting your image in and it creates like a um, glaze effect on the top of it that will that's preventing the AI from reconstructing it in a way. Oh, okay. um, I'm not I'm not using it for my commercial pieces because even if I would use it before I put it them online or in my portfolio, uh, magic as you mentioned uh, is also using my works as they are in a lot of places in the marketing on the website so even if i would use the glaze on the top of it it's still somewhere in the in the internet in you know in the original form <laughs> right i got you so it's sort of like there's not much of a point to, to yes. do that the, it's the corporations have to take they have to accept that then the as a process to do in order to truly protect the artworks from from being uh, um, farmed or whatever they they do to, to get it, yeah, and like still like if someone would take those pieces and use them to develop the tool, the tool itself and the output from this tool, it's not legal to use it because it's infringing the IP, right? Okay. Um, and I know that there are some cases that are currently happening with like, you know, first the big corporations fighting with the data sets that were used in there. Uh, for example, there is a website that is uh, called Get the Images, which basically sells different types of stock photography. Uh, and one of those data sets were using like millions of photographs from this website oh you don't want to mess with getty they they got money yeah. they'll sue you good <laughs> yeah so i i bet that in the future there will be tools that will be using you know the legal data sets uh but for now yeah it's interesting to see what will be happening happening with all those big corporations starting to you know fight for their work so yeah, it's it's I've, I would say this very it's very hard thing because you know all the law is still behind what is yeah. happening in yeah. the technology and the legislations are happening in the states and in the Europe, but it's still you know there is no not a final you know law or anything it's, to. Isn't isn't it crazy that like they yeah. can't just decide to like if like something's happening that's that's really needs to be taken care of they can't make the law happen fat what is it with government they're like we just have to take our time and be very slow because that's how we like to do things i don't get it it's it's a very strange thing at least in the united states that's it's mm -hmm. like a antiquated machine that's chugging to get to catch up with like things that it should just it should be there should be a quicker way to get it done um uh to do a quick divot i would like to know if money was not an option and you could own any piece of artwork in the world personally what oh god yes i'm putting you in there what painting would you choose <laughs> and, and the artist that's let's i mean money's not an option you can okay you can, you can buy it and you and you've got money to spare and you mm -hmm. can show it off um I think there will be like two artists that I will be interested in. Okay. So first, Yoshikata Amano, obviously, okay. because as far as I know, he didn't sold any of his originals. Really? Like he's he's keep I I'm, I'm I was reading about it like he's keeping all the originals from his work. And he was also doing the illustration slash concept art for Vampire Hunter D. That oh my very... God! He did. <laughs> so, he's so... just keeping it. No, I mean, you know, I you have every right to keep it, buddy. But come on, like, let's like. I, I mean, how much would you? I didn't you get an animation cell? Although, did I not see that you had an animation oh, cell? 
Uh, yeah, but animation cell was done by the animation artist. Like oh. Yoshikata Amano was working up on the initial like visuals, but he's he wasn't like doing the cells. It's, it's itself. still, I mean, it's still really cool that you got that. I mean, like it, that's yeah, the closest was, thing you can get to. That was I was taken by surprise, like completely by surprise. Uh, I was visiting Japan uh, last month. And I was uh, going around different shops and there was like specific types of shops that sells anime cells. And it was just, you know, on the front of the shop, lying there looking at me. <laughs> and I was like, wow. <laughs> and you're I was, like, uh, I'm going to have to do this. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, it wasn't like crazy, crazy expensive. But so I was able to get it. Um, but yeah, it was just taking me purely by surprise. So Yoshikata Amano is the first one. Um, and I would say that the second one would be Zdzisław Beksiński. And I, I'm I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with his work. He uh that, that movie The Cell was inspired heavily by him. Uh yes. The, uh oh gosh, yes. Okay, so we'll talk more about him. You would like to uh Wow. Do you have a specific piece that you have of, that, of his? All of would... them, like oh, all of them. Do... And like, and like, funnily enough, like a little bit similar to Yoshikata Amano, like almost all of his works, like most of it, not all of them, most of it are owned by Museum of Sanok, which is the city that he was born into, because oh, wow. it was like one of his last will to his work being in in this specific museum after uh, after his death that's so, beautiful that's yeah some beautiful. of them some of them are on the market uh, and of course they are crazy expensive <laughs> so uh, i would be happy to favorite though i mean you don't have one that like if you had to pick oh one, god i mean one i know of them. It's not, i know it's difficult but like for for funsies just you got you got to buy one painting it, I mean, um, like it's hard to even if I would choose, it will be hard to like point out you the specific one. I would need to like send you an image because he used to not to give uh, specific names to oh, his okay. paintings. Uh, but the there very... is like one that maybe you have like in in the search bar, like the one of the first with the rider on the horse. Oh um, God! Yes. Okay. Like so. Maybe that it's a is, baby. Maybe it's a you know grown up human. You don't know. That is a that is some nightmare fuel. I mean, yeah. Um, I, you, you gotta wonder, like, uh, I mean, I, I'd imagine his nightmares were epic. Um, and you, you you can still listen to some of the interviews uh, that he was given in the nineties, and mm -hmm. he is he's this very soft. Yes. super nice guy and he's he's like nothing like his work he looks like a college professor you know yeah like a very kind like very like you know he, he i mean he looks like a friendly dad like a yes. you know uh this that is the same like wes craven um you know looked it was you know looked really like gentle and peaceful like these these dark a lot of these dark artists are not always you know like it's it's you don't suspect you would not suspect like say Stephen King would have these like constant like horrific things coming out. He looks like you know, kind of a nerd, and you know we. Yes. I mean, I love nerds, nerd myself, but yeah, it's that that's yeah that's an astonish, astonishing painter. I mean, there is so much to go into, and I think there's so many elements of horror that oh there there's so many movies that owe their designs and so many paintings that own their designs to his his work and um, i would imagine i can even see the elements that you could I, you, one could say that you know because i always say that like art is like about bloodlines and so if you are really into a painter to the source of sort of like your artistic parent or you know grandparent or whatever mm -hmm. and so with your artwork for instance um i can see shades of that in the sunfall painting for mm -hmm. marshall machines which i mean awesome job showing heliod being the dick that he truly is because he is a monster <laughs> but it's it's got that element to it and, and um 
uh, the seed, the, the seed core too, as well. Like those are just phenomenally horror. E. And uh, I, I gotta say, like, if you could, if you like, if you were going to be able to illustrate sort of any sort of horror genre, what would be one that you would like enjoy doing? Like if somebody said like, do you, would you do like to do Gothic horror or maybe 1980s horror? Like what would be like a fun, like project that you would love to be presented with? Like ideal that you haven't done yet. I think anything that will be inspired by the goth subculture overall, uh, because I'm goth myself for most than half of my life. Uh, and it's something that's super important to me. Um, so anything that would be referring to like very, very old horror movies, like the black, black and white ones would be super interesting. And even something that refers to the horrors from the 80s or early 90s, the aesthetic there was, was something else. Like even, you know, even the, the, the kids movies from that time have they this. They were dark. They, were they dark. are dark. Like I very much love Labyrinth by Jim Henson. And yeah. the aesthetic of Labyrinth or Dark Crystal by him, it's, it's not something that I think will be approved nowadays <laughs> for, for Pixar children. Pixar would not story. be doing that. No. No. <laughs> no. Like, Definitely. I don't even think they would allow the angles of, like, because you know how angular, like, some of the creatures would look where, the, like, yes. it, they wouldn't even allow that. Everything's very round, very soft, right? Um, yes. Yeah. The 80s were, um, there were, it was a, there was a dark undercurrent going on with, uh, like, I think to counterbalance all the fluorescence and the jazzercise or whatever, you know, like <laughs> there was this underbelly, but yeah, there, that, that's, that's a good point you make there. Um, scariest movie you've ever seen. Scariest? Yes. Oh One God. Like, like uh, even though I love this aesthetic, I don't watch horror movies at all. You don't? I don't because I'm, I'm so into it i'm so immersed into it that is just like nope because i'll be scared for the rest of the night i like when is there you know there's some kind of the horror element overall in the movie but not horror itself i like it because so, of the visuals but the scariest I, I i'm not sure so you you kind of prefer a little an element of fantasy in your horror, yes. like as opposed to like say like a Texas Chainsaw Massacre where it's very yes. cool seeming like okay. Yeah, but, I I also have like a problem with like playing horror games. Uh, I try it really. Like for example, I'm I'm not sure if you've seen Amnesia, uh -huh. and it's like one of the scariest things ever because it's very. It's very interesting in terms of the design of the game, because for example, the game is teaching you that specific sounds of type of a music that is going in the background. It's telling you that, for example, the monster is coming to you, right? And oh, later okay. in the game, after you, you learn that and you expect that, and you start to hearing specific type of the music, oh. for, I don't know, for, for an hour of the play and there is no monster. Oh god. So the, game, so the game is trolling you. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, that suspense like because uh that was the old Alfred Hitchcock said he said what you do to create suspense you show two people seated at a table and then you pan down underneath the table and show a ticking time bomb and then go back up to the people and just let them sit there talk and the entire time the audience is going there's a bomb under the table there's a bomb under the table. Like yes, that exactly. sounds pretty damn intense because they just yeah. are messing with you. Wow. Oof. That's, yeah, and that's pretty and we, good. And we actually had a, like a small Halloween party with friends like years back when we decided to play Amnesia together. And it was we've done it in the way that uh, we are playing in the living room. The one person have like a spot in the front to play the game. We were using the TV screen for it, and the rest of the people are sitting in the back. And they can't show any support to the person that is playing right now. Oh, and we were changing um, each time there was a loading screen and loading screens were taking like a lot of time. It wasn't like it was constantly in there. So I remember each time where there was a loading screen and, you know, the 
the uh, the feeling of okay, whew, that's it for me. Now oh. you, now you go there. <laughs> oh God, that's that's the relief, you know. You can't sit. You can't be there with them. You have to watch because you're you're basically watching it as a movie, and yeah. they're the sort of part of the TV screen. That's that's awesome and cruel at the same time. <laughs> like you guys are sacrificing each other one by one, but it's cool. Yeah. I get it. It's like it's a it's an interesting horrifying like bonding experience i guess yeah exactly but it's not the type of a game that i would play myself like alone at home i tried and nope <laughs> nope no 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 <laughs> no but so but you you haven't seen a movie on accident that scared you like that was that scared you so bad no no it really? wasn't anything like that maybe when i was you know scrolling through different channels when i was a kid then maybe there was something that I didn't know, you know, the name of the movie that I was watching, but there was uh, a scene that made me scared. But n nothing in particular that I could think of right now. Gotcha. Before I let you go, I wanted to make sure that you have, if there's anything that you can discuss that is coming up, uh, please feel free to do so now. And anything <laughs> that you can hint at that you're working on, that you're allowed to hint at, it, it, this is your time. Also, let people know where to go to find your stuff and and find out more about you. All that that stuff, which I will put in the show notes as well. But this is your uh, this is the place to plug yourself as much oh. as you like. Okay, so um, I'm currently focusing on the project that I have in Techland we have an announced AAA fantasy game. So from post-apocalyptic game, we are also working right now on the fantasy game. We shown two key arts of it. Um, I cannot tell you more than just tell this is AAA open world fantasy game with a quite big impact on the narration. Um, so that's something that's close to my heart because I'm leading the whole concept team for this project currently. Ooh, you are leading a AAA concept team? Yes. You got to feel like a badass a little bit for that. Yeah. Like that's <laughs> that you that is awesome. Like now you're AAA. Like you like I I like have a yes. shirt made just <laughs> like AAA. Yeah, but you know, uh it's um it's a lot of pressure at one side, but on the other side I have super amazing art directors to work with. So I really love my job and it's super cool. So that's something that I'm focusing right now. Obviously in the back, I'm also doing still Magic the Gathering illustrations, but yeah, you will see within the year what I'm currently working at. It's always Excellent. like a like a year of wait to show right. this stuff. Um, and if you want to look for more of my work, you can go to kafisart.com. But I'm also super active on social media. So if you would like to look for me on Twitter or X, or as you X, can call like it, X. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Elon, that really took. <laughs> yeah, so you just you, you can just type Kafi's art in the, in the Google search and you will find me everywhere. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time again to talk to me today. You've been on, you're, you're on, you were on my bucket list and I'm so glad that I got a chance thank to you. talk to you. It was awesome. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. <laughs>